Hey everyone, Dr. Louie and Dr. Namani here back again with The Athlete Spine and we've got a real live person guest today, not, not on Zoom. So this is Dr. Brandon Carlson who's an assistant professor and spine surgeon uh, at the University of Kansas yep. joining us today. Yep, thanks for having me, this is great. Yeah, and we're actually coming to you live today from Stockholm, Sweden. We are here at the Scoliosis Research Society annual meeting and this is a society that's been around for a long time now and its main mission and focus is to educate people, uh, the public and other spine surgeons, as well as to perform research and help us uh, do scoli treat scoliosis patients better, whether that be without surgery or, or with an operation. And so this is a, a meeting that we're all blessed to be attending and, uh, and we're really excited to be here and present this topic to you today about scoliosis. Yep. And so, you know, we figured, hey, what, what better opportunity to introduce uh, the spinal problem that we see all over the place and, and you know, our goal today is to you know, tell you what we look for in a patient that presents with scoliosis, how we evaluate it, and the different treatments that are out there and that we can provide, and sort of bringing it back to the athlete and you know, the ability to return back to play. So, yes, so first if we kind of take a step back and think about what is scoliosis. So scoliosis is an abnormal curvature of the spine when you look at someone from the front. So normally the spine is perfectly straight up and down, if someone has a curvature of over 10 degrees, that is what qualifies as scoliosis. Now, this is actually quite common. It's really common in, in women or girls, and, um, uh, and, and, and it can progress in terms of the size of the curvature, and some of the larger curvatures are the ones that we're concerned about, and some of the smaller curvatures are things that don't even need any sort of treatment. Uh, but Dr. Carlson, when you see a patient in your clinic with scoliosis, how do you assess it and how do you think about this? Yeah, it's a great question. It's a really common presentation actually in younger, younger adults. Uh, most commonly is found in some sort of screening program in a school. Mm -hmm. And that's where a, par a parent will bring their child to us and, and they'll be very concerned. They've, they've been told they have scoliosis and it's typically just found by some sort of asymmetry on their back. And so when they come to our clinics, we, we evaluate their whole kind of picture in terms of their presentation and how they stand and the balance of their shoulders, maybe the balance of their hips. There's some asymmetries that we'll see with maybe sort of a rib asymmetry or a hump on their back that's in the more the larger curves. And then we uh, can sometimes see creases in their, in their sides, things like that. That's typically when we start to look at more advanced things like an x-ray or a picture. So we take a long x-ray of the whole body and then we as spine clinicians can and measure that curve and we do some serial examination. So these patients will come back multiple times, we'll look at their different growth parameters, we'll look at growth plates on the x-rays, and we'll be looking at that curve over time to see what happens. That's really what guides our, our trajectory in terms of how we treat them or what's the next step and things like that. The SRS really defines a lot of what that algorithm looks like for us, and it's building on the shoulders of people that have done this for you know 50 to 100 years now. Um, so it's, it's an important uh, entry point into our clinic where we get to do that first evaluation. But it doesn't always mean that someone's going to be taken out of sports or other activities, which I think is the really important message here that we're going to tell families about that many times these kids will leave completely normal lives. They just need to come see us a few times. Yeah. And, and, I think the, and I think the important thing um, is that we have to distinguish when someone comes to see us first is this is scoliosis that we are worried about or is this a scoliosis that we are not as worried about. And, and the good thing is that the vast majority of scoliosis falls into a category called idiopathic scoliosis, which means that there's inherently nothing wrong with the spinal cord, there's nothing wrong with the nervous system, there's nothing wrong with the muscular system, uh, and those are the types of scoliosis that healthy teenagers get. Um, and as long as that curvature is relatively small, then, then really often no treatment is necessary. But the key in the first evaluation in the physical exam maneuvers like you talked about and some of the imaging characteristics uh, that you talked about, these things are all to determine if someone has one of those dangerous types of scoliosis uh, that we need to pay more attention to and might need more aggressive treatment. Yeah, and it's, it's good to think about it and it's good to remember that in the majority of cases, the scoliosis that we are seeing in the SAGE population are this idiopathic population. So although the term may be scary itself, uh, these kids or these adolescents aren't complaining about a lot of pain. In fact, most of them who have this idiopathic scoliosis don't even know that they have it, yeah. right? It, it's not progressing so fast that they've noticed bodily changes and it's not causing back pain to the point that it's preventing them from doing what they're doing. 
So Dr. Carlson, what, what sort of treatments do we have for these patients or, or what do we tell them and, and how do we decide what to do next? Yeah, exactly. Again, it's based a lot on their aging and the, the size of their curvature, uh, but there's some patients we just watch and they need to come back you know, every several months, depends on the time course of their aging, uh, to check to see if the curve is even progressing. And then when they get into a different curve category or a little bit larger, maybe there's a brace that we can build for them. It's a special brace that goes on the outside, puts some forces on the spine to try to keep it from progressing. And in the more advanced cases, sometimes people do need to have a surgery. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about professional athletes who have had scoliosis that have gone through all three of those treatments. And they've both been, and all three of them have uh, been able to still progress and, and play sport at the highest level that we can even imagine. So it doesn't change someone's life to have scoliosis to the point where you're not going to be able to do these things. I have that conversation with families all the time. You know, that's a very scary diagnosis the first time they meet us. And I tell them, keep playing volleyball or keep playing basketball or go play golf. And, and they can't really fathom that initially, but it's an important message to take home. Right. And I think the, I think the, the takeaway is, you know, small curve in someone who is close to being done with their growth often doesn't require any sort of aggressive treatment, not even bracing. Larger curve in someone who has a lot of growth potential often will require some sort of active treatment, uh, whether that be bracing or potentially surgery. But despite um, uh, these, the need for some sort of more active or aggressive treatment, people can actually lead very successful and highly functional lives and play professional sports. Yeah, I and mean, when we say like highly functioning, I mean, we're talking even about some of the most gifted, gifted athletes out there. I mean, Usain Bolt's a great example who we know had scoliosis at a young age and who has chosen not to seek tra treatment for that, but is probably the fastest uh, human on earth that we've seen in, yeah. in winning multiple Olympic golds. And, and it's even been documented that the curvature causes him to actually have an asymmetric stride when he's running, but he's been able to compensate for that fairly well, yeah. if we could say. I would think yeah. so. Yeah. yeah, so. James yeah. Blake's another great example. Yeah. He's a professional tennis player. He went through a bracing regimen as a kid, never had surgery though, and he still plays high level tennis. Yeah, and Stacey Lewis is a professional golfer on the LPGA Tour who actually had ended up having surgery for scoliosis and was able to go back to playing on the LPGA Tour and has done remarkably well. And so certainly even having scoliosis and even the need for surgery for scoliosis is not a contraindication in going back to sports and, and doing uh, a, lot of, a lot of active activities. Yeah, so I mean, I think it just goes to show that, yes, the term scoliosis may be scary, but there's a lot that goes into that diagnosis. Any final thoughts at all? No, I think we've touched on a lot of things that I think viewers and families will value. I think that that's a, you know, sort of a big take home is that if someone says that your child has scoliosis, get them in to be seen and, and connect with a clinician who can track it over time. Uh, but, you know, maybe rest at ease a little bit that your child or, or kid can still play all the sports they want to play, that are going to be very competitive in all the athlete uh, realms that they want to be in. And, and so it's a, it's a good thing that, you know, we can still offer that to the patient that comes in with scoliosis. So until next time, uh, it's Dr. Louie and Dr. Namani and Dr. Carlson here uh, uh, from Stockholm. Uh, you know, with the athlete's fine, be sure to like and subscribe and follow us on Instagram. Take care, guys. All right. See you later. See ya.